Imagine you have tons of text data to analyze. And you want to get an overview of your data, but traditional topping modeling techniques such as LDA are not working for you. Then, why don't you try Architext? We introduce a scalable and flexible way to interactively build hierarchical topics. Visualizing class separations is using applications such as classification and clustering. However, many dimension reduction techniques are limited due to the issues of separability and interpretability. We propose a visual analytics framework to support the exploration of nonlinear complex separation structures with the power of locally linear separations. Ecosystems are complex and dynamic. To investigate the dynamic nature of ecosystems, we have developed a prototype of a visual analytics system based on empirical dynamic modeling, EDM. EDM is a set of analytical methods rooted in nonlinear state space reconstruction. Integrating EDM with dimensionality reduction, brush linked visualizations, and visual summarization support understandings of ecosystem dynamics. How do we represent remote users in synchronized visualizations while supporting divergent exploration? We present cursors, the basic unit of user representation in a collaborative visualization. They can vary significantly in appearance, as you can see. Cursors enable collaborative interaction techniques, such as peaking, tracking, and forking. To learn more, please read our paper representing real-time multi-user collaboration and visualization. Digital humanities present great opportunities for testing new visualization approaches and evaluation techniques. However, and given the diffuse character and novelty of the field, it may also be intimidating for novel and senior researchers willing to get started in the discipline. In this paper, we propose a data-driven analysis of visualization for the digital humanities to identify key themes, authors, and relevant publications. So if you want to know more, please read our paper. Analyzing urban heat island phenomena, which cause higher temperature in cities, requires to explore the relationships between climate and urban morphology. In an ongoing co-visualization framework, we propose different ways to visually explore both urban and climate data at a city block scale in order to support the analysis of urban heat islands. <laughs> Hands-on cybersecurity training represents a domain where vision analytics can significantly improve the impact of teaching process. We describe this new application domain and introduce a conceptual model that can serve as a framework for the development of analytical visualizations. Unified training lifecycle will be discussed from the perspective of different user roles. We demonstrate that people can use the special cues available in virtual reality to help them effectively remember and recall scholarly articles. We used a virtual coffee shop and asked participants to remember four abstracts from scientific publications. And we termed this method a virtual reality memory palace variety. We have seen many visualizations for tree data structures, but when showing changes in trees over time, some focus on displaying hierarchy, while others highlight their changes. With split streams, we combine two approaches and their individual benefits. 
We evaluated our method in a user study and consider it a general purpose method for the visualization of dynamic hierarchies. Our JavaScript library is openly available. Do these three essays construct their argumentation similarly? Where in this table of argumentation data from the previously seen texts can I find certain argumentation patterns? Do these three argument maps depict the same argument? We have developed a visual analysis system for argumentation in essays that can answer these questions at a glance. You want to know how it works? Come to my talk. Programmers often make mistakes like this. A BS function is incorrectly called with a string. A programming language can catch such mistakes early on, but for this, it needs a type system. We present Typical, an interactive visualization tool for programming language designers. Typical allows them to explore common function type signatures and helps create a type system. The daily work of criminalists consists of analyzing relationships in complex data while proposing and verifying multiple hypotheses, often under heavy pressure. This poses high demands on their memory and cognitive capacity. We present Visaland, a tool that helps investigators track their visual exploration and reasoning. It organizes analytical states in a graph structure, which can be revisited and shared with colleagues. Deep neural networks are vulnerable to maliciously generated adversarial examples. This brings high risk in applying these networks to safety critical applications. We develop a visual analytics approach to explain the root cause of such wrong predictions. Our contribution contains a constrained path extraction method, a river based visualization, and a contribution analysis method. Interacting with large datasets could be painfully slow. We can reduce the latency with faster backends, but that's not always attainable. Here, we investigate a solution that only leverages techniques on the front end. We propose interaction snapshots, where users can view the results at a later time. We found that users experienced much less frustration and were able to complete the tasks faster. Evaluating alternative interpretations is an essential part of complex sense making, but the resulting ambiguity is rarely considered in the design of visual analytic systems. Avalanche forecasters rely on sparse and human produced data to assess avalanche hazards, often resulting in ambiguous interpretations. We use simple glyphs and unit visualizations to specifically consider and support ambiguity in the avalanche forecasters' sense making processes. As commonly known, dimensional interreduction techniques and their interpretations are complex, biased, and uncertain. In drug design, this highly complicates the search for similar and new chemical compounds. To overcome this issue, Canva brings comparison of different molecular descriptors and properties into one tool, featuring planar, 3D, and table views for evaluating the trustworthiness of high-dimensional data projection.
we propose an interactive ensemble analysis framework that provides flexible interactive exploration of the ensemble data. Time series characteristics of data can be obtained by fast browsing time steps. The region stability heat map view shows the stability of the selected region and provides region adjustment by directly clicking. We propose X matrix, a novel method for random forest interpretability. From a random forest model, a logic rule is extracted from each decision path on every decision tree. Once the complete set of logic rules is obtained, visual representations can be built for global and local explanations. X matrix, making random forests interpretable. DVR has always been from considerable interest to the scientific community. To this day, traditional desktop setups are the gold standard. However, what if we could utilize DVR in virtual reality? Now you think, VR and DVR are so computationally expensive, how is this even feasible? Come to my talk and we present you a straightforward solution to visualize volumetric datasets with high refresh rates on VR devices. When visualizing data in a realistic render 3D environment, it is important to represent the data in a readable way. In our work, we investigate how the opacity affects the readability of a 2D shape and determine useful opacity values. Therefore, we perform the user study with different overlay configuration, like filled, striped, and dotted pattern, the density, and consider the effect of an outline. Tableau helps you see the stories in your data. It's designed to help you be smarter so you can make better decisions faster. With Tableau, you can keep on asking questions in the data until you discover the root cause. Share your analysis securely. Your entire organization can access these interactive dashboards from any browser or mobile device to find their own answers. Tableau, answer questions at the speed of thought. In a visualization, laying out labels to data points needs to be done automatically with a fast labeling algorithm. We introduce occupancy bitmap. It's a data structure that helps the labeling algorithm to first, quickly record the positions of existing marks and labels, and second, quickly detect overlapping of labels to the recorded positions. Mars complexes have shown a great utility in understanding the topology of complex scientific datasets. The noise in the scalar field, however, can significantly distort the Mars complex topology. Hence, we study the extraction of Mars complexes for ensembles of noisy scalar fields through their uncertainty visualization using our proposed statistical summary maps. In visual multivariate analysis, we often want to find out how the variables in the set relate to a particular target variable. Imagine we have medical data from patients that suffer from a specific disease. Then we might like to understand which conditions predict a more severe progression of the disease. This is a challenging task because the explanation could involve a specific combination of several factors. We propose a novel method based on neural networks to visually explain relationships in multivariate datasets that can also recognize more complex nonlinear correlations. Deep learning models have become ubiquitous, but we often lack interpretations for their decisions. We developed a visual analytic system to interpret models that perform multi-class DGA classification. For each layer of the model, we visualize clusters inside its activation data, showing how classes and clusters relate to each other. In addition, we provide a decision tree to explain how these clusters are constructed. If machine learning were like education, we would like to test what concepts our student, the model, has learned. Does it learn the concept of object rotation? Does additional text help with object recognition? We need a methodology and platform for conducting such tests. In this paper, we present a novel visual analytics tool that enables hypothesis-based evaluation of machine learned models.
Data lakes can contain millions of tables. Data portals have tools like keyword search to find data sets, but often researchers don't care about semantics, but rather structural metadata. Can I find a data set with many rows, few columns, and preferably a high number of unique values? Log Perspective visualizes structural properties based on the user's needs and helps researchers fish out data sets with appropriate structural properties. Tableau helps you see the stories in your data. It's designed to help you be smarter, so you can make better decisions faster. With Tableau, you can keep on asking questions in the data until you discover the root cause. Share your analysis securely. Your entire organization can access these interactive dashboards from any browser or mobile device to find their own answers. Tableau, answer questions at the speed of thought. White space surfaces are a novel approach to convey depth in vessel visualizations. The core idea is to shift all additional depth cues away from geometry and to use the usually empty space between the vascular structures. This allows us to display functional parameters on the surface and supporting cues on the background. We will explain how to generate such surfaces and how to use them as a canvas to further enhance depth and shape perception. Forensic investigation of file system metadata is a difficult and time-consuming task that requires deep expert knowledge. Following a user-centered design, we implemented an analytical tool to guide analysts during a security incident investigation. The evaluation proved that the tool could significantly improve the efficiency of disk exploration, even for less experienced analysts. Ecosystems are complex and dynamic. To investigate the dynamic nature of ecosystems, we have developed a prototype of a visual analytics system based on empirical dynamic modeling, EDM. EDM is a set of analytical methods rooted in nonlinear state space reconstruction. Integrating EDM with dimensionality reduction, brush linked visualizations, and visual summarization support understandings of ecosystem dynamics.
CMED is a visual analytics framework for exploring medical image data annotations acquired from crowdsourcing. CMED can be used to visualize, classify, and filter crowdsourced clinical data based on a number of different metrics such as detection rate, logged events, and clustering of the annotations. CMED provides several interactive linked visualization components to analyze the crowd annotation results for a particular video and the associated workers. General audience is likely to become distracted during the ever-changing animated visualization and reluctant to consume the entire animation. Informed by the role of foreshadowing that builds the expectation in film and literature, we formulate and apply visual foreshadowing on animated bar chart to improve its engagement. In addition, we implement a proof of concept authoring tool and conduct a user study to learn the efficacy of engagement enhancement of our approach. Transitions are widely used in the videos to build seamless changes between video narrative. As the attention cue, they can not only keep viewers oriented but also express narrative information. After conducting a content analysis on the transitions in the dataset, we provide a comprehensive taxonomy of narrative transitions in data videos. And welcome to the VIS 2020 Short Papers opening session. My name is um, Roxana Bujak. I am a staff scientist at Los Alamos National Laboratory in the United States, and I am the returning chair for the Short Papers. Hi, this is Enrico Bertini from New York University. Hi, this is Wen Wen Do from UNC Charlotte. Hi, my name is Christopher Collins from Ontario Tech University. Hello, I'm Alexander Lex. I'm an associate professor at the University of Utah. My name is Timo Rupinski from the Visual Computing Group at Ulm University in Germany. This year we had a rather large IPC for the IEEE with short papers program. In total we had 131 people from all over the world. So we would like to thank them all for their contribution to this program and all the efforts they have invested in reviewing and uh, deciding upon the papers. You might wonder why the number is uh, rather high in comparison to previous years, and this is uh, due to the coronavirus crisis. Since we had a lot of uncertainties to deal with in this whole process, we were not sure how much commitment the individual IPC members in the end can make, and so we rather decided uh, to have uh, not unroll one third as is usually done in previous years, but keep most of the people in the IPC and additionally invite more people to join. When you look at the nationalities, we had uh, 19 nationalities 
Um, the nationalities uh, were from all over the world. US had the highest number of individuals serving on the IPC, but we also had a lot of people from Europe and, and from Canada, Asia and basically all over the world. With respect to gender balance, uh, we are a little bit better than uh, in previous year, but still there's a lot of room for improvement. So we have 73% of males and 27% of females serving on the IPC. But fortunately, we had a roughly equal split with respect to the different disciplines, Infobiz, Cybis and Fast. And now I would like to give over to Alex, who will say a few words about the review process. So I'll walk you through our review process this year. Each paper was assigned a primary and a secondary reviewer drawn from our program committee. The committee members were assigned to the papers based on the bidding and their expertise. We typically assign three reviews to each committee member. Um, the primary then assigned one external reviewer to uh, a paper. And then authors had the choice to submit papers either a single blind or a double blind. Um, each paper received at least three reviews. Um, that the reviews then were followed by a discussion phase amongst the program committee members and the external reviewer. The primary then gives a recommendation for accept or reject. The paper chairs make these conditional accept decisions based on this information. And this is followed by the office preparing a revision, which the paper chairs then reviewed and make a final accept decision. So here are some numbers. We had 164 submissions this year, which is slightly down from last year. One paper was desk rejected, one paper was withdrawn by the author, authors, 58 were accepted, which results in a 36% acceptance rate, which is slightly up from last year. Uh, 104 papers were rejected. The average review score for all papers was 2.8, and the lowest average score for an accepted paper was 2.67, and the highest average score for a rejected paper was 3.33. As you probably all know, last year was the very first time that we had a short paper session that spanned all three branches, InfoViz, SciViz and VAST together in, in one track. And the biggest challenge last year was to set everything up and the huge workload that came from the great and unexpected popularity of the short paper track and the many submissions that we got. So for this year, we got two additional chairs. So we have six chairs this year, which really helped a lot with, with all the work that comes from just dealing with this large number of submissions. So that was really great, great relief. But well, we had a completely new challenge this year. And yeah, that's all the stuff around COVID-19, of course. Um, the full papers track delayed their deadline. And so our original plan that we had to be deadline-wise right in the middle so that rejected full papers could become short papers and in the same way to the back end that rejected short papers could still be resubmitted as posters was no longer possible after this um, deadline shift of the full papers. So we had a very long discussion about which of the two bridges we want to keep and in the end decided to go with a postponed deadline of the short papers too, so that um, we can still find the connection with the with the full papers. We even put out a survey and tried to figure out how many resubmissions we had last year and stuff to figure out which bridge is the more important one. And that is what we finally ended up with. It was a tough decision. And I really hope that next year everything <laughs> will be just fine so that both connections will become possible again. The break with the poster submission was not the only problem that came with postponing the deadline, but the other one was that we had a very, very strict timeline with, with the reviewers. And that, of course, made it hard for our committee. So thank you guys uh, so much for making everything work in this very strict uh, period of time. But also for the, the authors who had to make the changes really quickly, make videos. Oh, of course, yeah, the next big challenge is we have an online conference, right? So preparing all the videos and all the other material that needs to be sent in um, is a big challenge. Also um, setting up sessions so that they will work across different time zones is like really hard. Um, we, well, we did what we could, but the final um, program is actually out of our hands. So I really apologize if you guys have to stay up 
in the middle of the night to give your presentation. Um, yeah, but thank you so much for doing that. And yeah, and of course the challenge that is always there is if we have to fix stuff where people did not read their instructions properly. Okay, for short papers, we have a total of seven sessions. The first one is on Tuesday at 11.30. And it's about visualization and scientific computing. And the session chair is gonna be Christina Gilman. Then on Wednesday, we have a total of three sessions. The first one is at 8 a.m. and it's called Geospatial Finance and Health. And the session chair is gonna be Bador Saket. Then we have another one at 10. It's called Systems, Libraries and Algorithms. And the session chairs is gonna be Alper Sarikaya. And finally, at uh, 12 p.m., we have a session called Interaction and Animation and the session chair is gonna be Emily Wall. On Thursday, the first session is at 8 a.m. and it's called Theory, Cognition and Sense Making. And the session chair is gonna be Cindy Xiong. And then we have the second session at 10 a.m. It's called Text and Communication. And the session chair is gonna be Mena El Asadi. And finally, on Friday, we have our last session for short papers, and it's called Visualizing Machine Learning. And the session chair is gonna be Joshua Kraus. This year's Best Short Papers Committee was chaired by Fanny Chevalier, accompanied by David Gotts and Hans Christian Hege. We're grateful for their service. The process this year was that the co-chair selected five papers based on the review scores, as well as the discussion and the best paper flags that were set in the system. We then passed these papers to the committee, which was composed of members who had expertise covering all areas of the call for papers. The committee then discussed and uh, scored the papers and compiled their scores, and the criteria they were using were novelty, technical contribution, the quality of the presentation, as well as the expected influence on future research. I'm happy to announce that the committee unanimously chose the paper Anatomical Edutainer. This paper by Marwin Schindler, Sang Yun Wu, and Renata Raidu presents a workflow to guide an easy, accessible, and affordable generation of physicalizations for tangible anatomical edutainment. This combination of 2D and 3D components, along with lenses to change the views, creates a playful and novel visualization environment while leveraging rendering, printing, and physical interactions. One of the reviewers said, I had not even considered the idea of a printable and foldable structure for 3D anatomical data. Worse, had someone suggested this concept to me, I would have probably thought it was a bad idea. And yet this paper demonstrates well this original concept and I love the results. The Best Paper Committee says, we find this very inspiring. It's an original idea and the paper is self-contained and self-sufficient. The proposed ideas are forward thinking and the expected impact is very strong. Again, congratulations to the authors on this achievement and we look forward to hearing your presentation. Hi, this is Wen Wen Do. It is my pleasure to introduce the honorable mentions for the short paper track. And the first paper I'm going to introduce is the encodable Configurable Grammar for Visualization Components. And the author is Chris Wangsefasawa. And um, the best paper committee commented that this paper presented a very elegant and useful approach to programming for visualization. And this paper can also have a strong impact. The approach is neat. The library has been released as open source. The examples, one of them is shown in the slide, are very compelling. So please join me to congratulate the author for winning the Best Honorable Mention Award. The next honorable mention paper is Pragma, Interactively Constructing Functional Brain Parcellations. And the authors are Rosa Ganis Bayrek, Nang Hong, Colin Blake Hansen, Katie Chang, Matthew Berger. And the Best Short Paper Committee commented that, again, this is exceptional work. It's really well done. The methods are sound, the execution is rigorous, and the findings potential are potentially useful to the whole community. 
then it is very solid work in its own category. Please join me to congratulate the authors for winning the Honorable Mention Award. Welcome everyone to the Viz 2020 poster program. Uh, myself and my co-chairs across Vast InfoViz and SciViz uh, had the pleasure of reviewing uh, a large set of posters. So 46 poster submissions, 42 were accepted uh, across Vast InfoViz and SciViz. Uh, and they will be available for viewing Wednesday, October 28th uh, at 1.30 p.m. Mountain Time. Now, uh, viewing of posters is going to be a little different this year for a number of reasons. One is the obvious that we're remote. Uh, but there is also the digital poster uh, technique that we're using this year for the uh, posters in general. Now, let me show you quickly what that looks like. So when you click on that link there, uh, you'll be shown the posters gallery as it is here. And every poster is given a card, so an image and some information about it. And you can casually browse posters as you usually would at Viz by scrolling down and seeing all of the posters uh, neatly on this gallery here. Uh, there's also some filters at the top where you can sort by events or you can uh, search for specific words. And when you find one you like, such as maybe this one here, uh, you can click on it and then you're shown the actual poster. Uh, and now you're starting to see some of the reasons why we went to a interactive poster like this, because there's a number of links that you can click on to get more information. And you're also uh, able to see animated uh, visuals like this one here to really showcase the work uh, of the posters. Now, uh, I encourage you to go check out this link. It'll be up the entire time uh, that this is happening, so you can browse the posters at any time. Uh, and again, if you want to chat with the presenters, uh, please mark your calendar for 1.30 Mountain Time on Wednesday. Uh, in addition to that, there are also Discord channels set up for discussion with authors, as well as the community at large, uh, to really uh, discuss the posters in the context of this this year. So this brings us to the best poster awards already. Um, let's start with West. We managed to invite a brilliant committee consisting of Rita Borgo, Melanie Torrey, and Sheeting Wang. Um, they reviewed and ranked for poster candidates um, for the awards. And based on this ranking, we selected one vast best poster research award and one vast honorable mention poster research award. And the Honorable Mention Poster Research Award goes to Mapping Researchers with People Map by Jan Saad Falcon and colleagues. Congratulations. And the vast best poster research award goes to Visual Exploration of Network Meta Analysis Data by Huan Wei and colleagues. Congratulations. Um, so for InfoViz, uh, we had 25 accepted posters, among which uh, we, the chairs, selected four candidate posters, which we handed to another fantastic um, best poster award committee, which consisted of Manuela Waldner, Lynn Bartram, and Yunhai Wang. Based on a ranking, which they individually did on those four posters, they then selected one best poster award and two honorable mention poster awards. The first InfoViz Honorable Mention Poster Research Award goes to a minimally constrained optimization algorithm for table cardiograms by Andrew McNutt and Gordon Kindleman, which, by the way, is the poster that we interactively saw before. Congratulations. So the second uh, honorable mention poster research award goes to generating seizure inducing sequences with interactive visualization by Laura South and M Michelle Borkin. Congratulations. And the best poster InfoViz research award goes to toward knowledge based recommendation system for genomics visualization by Aditya Pandey and colleagues. Congratulations. So for the uh, CIVIS 2020 Poster Awards, we uh, had uh, seven submissions. And from these we, ones, we selected two that we gave to our also excellent committee consisting of Ivan Viola and Eugene Sang. They unanimously selected one CIVIS Best Poster Research Award, and the award goes to 
automatic generation of data legends for 3D multivariate artist-driven visualizations by Claire Weisman and colleagues. Congratulations. Okay, that's it from the posters. Don't forget, they're presented on Wednesday via the iPoster system. That's interactive, so you can access it anytime. And the communication during the poster session will take place via Discord. Also, stay tuned for the Design Award. Hi everyone and welcome to our first short paper session, which is about uh, cybers and scientific computing. And we're gonna have nine uh, very interesting talks today. By the way, my name is Christina Gilman and uh, I'm gonna guide you through this session. Uh, in general, you can put all your questions on Discord or in the YouTube channel, they're interlinked to each other and I'm gonna read them out in the end of each uh, of the talks. Uh, first of all, we're going to start with topology, uh, topological analysis of magnetic reconnection and kinetic plasma simulations. And uh, this talk is going to be given by Divya Banish. And now the stage is yours, Divya. Hello, my name is Divya Banesh. I'm a PhD student at UC Davis and a graduate student researcher at Los Alamos National Labs. Today I'll be discussing our work on the topological analysis of magnetic reconnection in kinetic plasma simulations. Our motivation from reconnection study is driven by astrophysics. We know that over 99% of the known universe is in a state of plasma. As this plasma interacts with magnetic fields, for example, or Earth's magnetosphere, they result in reconnection events that impact the electric fields and devices here on Earth. There's actually a whole field of study on this called space weather. Computational physicists interested in reconnection generate simulations to analyze this process. PIC or particle in cell is a common category of such simulations. Here we show a lick visualization of the magnetic field of a single current sheet 2D VPIC simulation. The BX and BZ components are in plane, while the out of plane component BY is shown by the hot cold color map. Through a mathematical derivation, we determine that the contours of A, the magnetic vector potential, are tangential to the magnetic field B. B is also the curl of A. Therefore, we can determine that the contours of the magnetic vector potential are enough to understand the interactions in the magnetic field. We take this route because it allows us to understand reconnection through a scalar field rather than having to analyze a vector, a vector field. In these simulations, there are various ver features of interest as diagrammed in here. A magnetic reconnection event, diagrammed at the top, is the bending, joining, and breaking apart of oppositely directed magnetic field lines. The point at which they join is called the reconnection point. Once enough of these events occur, we have the occurrence of a magnetic island, a region encircled by a constant magnetic field line. Both these features result in the conversion of potential energy from the magnetic field to kinetic energy in the motion of plasma particles. To understand and extract these features, we use topological segmentation, specifically contour trees, as our algorithm of choice. We apply, it to, we apply it to the scalar field of the magnetic vector potential. This is akin to warping the scalar magnetic vector potential field by its scalar value, as shown on the right, 
um, and mapping maxima to peaks, minima to the endpoints, and the beginning of the peaks to the saddle points. The saddle points also correspond to the ISO value that segment the data into regions. What's interesting is that the saddle points correspond exactly by definition to the location of the magnetic reconnection points and the segments correspond to the magnetic islands. We also know that magnetic fields and electric fields extend to infinity, but this is impossible to simulate on a computer. Simulations are therefore defined on rectangular regions, and the boundaries are defined to be either uniperiodic or biperiodic to achieve the effect of infinity. The figure on the left is a uniperiodic dataset, while the figure on the right is a biperiodic dataset. We use polar coordinates to bend the data into either an annulus or a torus and stitch the boundaries together. <clears throat> Here we see the results of the contour tree analysis for one of the outputs of our VPIC simulation. We triangulate the vertices based on the boundary conditions and apply a persistence value where the persistence is simulation driven. We then feed this into the topology toolkit framework um, and use a contour tree to, uh, to extract the segmentation and critical points. Each of the segments is uniquely colored as shown in this figure and the critical points are yellow for minima, red for saddle, and blue for maxima. As I mentioned before, the use of persistence is important to our workflow um, for, various season, for various reasons. The persistence threshold re, um, minimizes the impact of noise to our results. However, the persistence of each of the segments of the data is also important because it's a physical quantity that corresponds to the magnetic flux, a reconnection analysis quantity that's important for, for reconnection studies. In this figure, we show a region of interest from the data in the previous slide the figure on the left has a persistence of 0, and the figure on the, left, on the right, a nominal persistence of 0 0.1. We can see that even with such a small persistence value, it severely impacts our results and ensures that we have a proper analysis. This really highlights the importance of a parameter, a parameter such as persistence. <clears throat> One of the unexpected results of applying topological an analysis to plasma was the discovery of a minima in the midst of the simulation. This feature corresponds to a flow of current in the opposite direction in the region as compared to the other features in the area. For example, as seen in the illustration on the top, all of the islands, um, including the children that are born of the parental islands, have a clockwise orientation, a clockwise magnetic field orientation. These correspond to a maxima, and that's why we have all peaks when we looked at the data that was warped. <clears throat> However, in rare cases, we, we can have um, the plasma particles push in on the magnetic field, causing a dip to occur, as shown in the bottom illustration, that results in the generation of a new island, which has a reverse uh, magnetic field orientation. <clears throat> this is a phenomenon that's not generally seen, um, and in fact has not previously been recorded for plasma for dynamic uh, simulations such as these. This is seen in our data in the figure on the bottom there where we see a minima in the region instead of a blue dot corresponding to a maximum. This also corresponds to an inverse in the flow of energy because generally the energy flows from the magnetic field to the plasma particles and here we see energy flowing from the particles back to the magnetic field. Looking uh, towards the future, the real challenge and the real analysis for this type of uh, visualization is the application of the topological segmentation to a more complicated data such as this. This is an eight current sheet data and we can clearly see the complex nested structure and the hierarchy of the data. Whereas in the previous data, the scientists might have been able to approximate some of the results. In a data such as this, that would be quite impossible. Thank you for your time and I would like to thank my colleagues on this project and open up the floor to questions. All right, everyone. So uh, you can post your questions on Discord or on the YouTube channel. Um,
Okay, thank you, Divya, for your very nice talk. Uh, I'm going to start collecting the questions. Peter Ristov is uh, asking, how can this work be extended to 3D? Um, <clears throat> the extension to 3D depends on how the science um, corresponds from and, and, and the fits of the plasma simulations goes from 2D to 3D. We have looked at some some uh, discussions and had some discussions about if this is possible to extend it into 3D. Um, we, we did a little bit further in more detail in our paper about how we're able to, to use topology in 2D as of the actual uh, correlation between the magnetic field line lines and the contrines. Um, however, a lot isn't possible and it doesn't hold in, in 3D. So um, really uh, uh, a lot of um, discussion and going back and forth with the phys physicists to, to really see what components we can extend, extend to be and what's not possible. It's sort of our future, future planned work. All right. Uh, I actually will have uh, one more question uh, for you. Um, can you imagine uh, ex extract or uh, transferring this work into another application? Let's say some other kind of vector fields or some other kind of uh, merging fields that you showed. Um, sure. I mean, contour trees for analysis of vector fields or, or regular field data is, is you know, really well-used uh, um, application. So it, it's, you know, using contour tree topology for, for data analysis is a very, very <clears throat> robust field of scientific visualization. However, for us, really, really the idea is what is data? And of course, in, in scientific visualization question that we must answer, answer is what data and how, do, how does the method um, sol solve the that we're trying to solve? To solve? So if, uh, uh, if it's possible to extend, extend this kind of analysis to another data and it makes sense to do so, then of course, that would be a great tool to use. All right, thank you very much. Okay, our uh, next talk is a virtual frame buffer extraction for parallel rendering of large tile display walls. And the talk is given by, uh, is given by Meng Chao Han. So the stage is yours. Hello, I'm Meng Zhao from Skin Institute, University of Utah. Today, I'm going to present our work of a virtual frame buffer abstraction for parallel rendering of large tail display walls. Display in using a large-scale tail display has multiple benefits. This displays increase the user sense of immersion, convey a sense of scale, and the high resolution is valuable when visualizing highly detailed data sites. Most importantly, this kind of large-scale displays are powerful communication tools that can engage a large group of collaborators. A common solution for driving tail displays is parallel rendering on a cluster based on OpenGL. Chromium and Chromium render server launch an instance of the application on each display node, and with a master node broadcast to user interactions. However, this method is limited by the available power on the display nodes, requiring powerful on-site hardware. An alternative method is to having each node render the pixels and use a compilator of pixel routing framework, send pixels from the render nodes to display nodes, such as ST and Equalizer. However, Chromium and Equalizer are specific to OpenGL, and ST is less applicable to tail-based retracer. Display cluster is similar to our work, which makes a clear distinction between a display wall and a client application. Sage 2 is another popular window environment for tail displays, designed for collaborative workspaces on tail display walls. Omega Lab is designed for similar use cases, with a focus on stereo tail display environments. These libraries are more similar to full featured window managers support displaying multiple applications on the wall simultaneously. Virus, in contrast, we aim to provide a simple lightweight framework abstraction that can be rendered by a single application. In our paper, we present a lightweight open source framework for driving tail display walls that can be integrated into CPU and GPU renderers easily. The framework can operate in a dispatcher or direct mode to support typical network configurations. We demonstrate this framework for use in deploying low-cost alternatives for display walls. Our framework, referred to as DW2, 
is sublet into an MPI parallel display service that manages the mapping from the single virtual frame buffer to the physical tail display wall and a client library used to connect renderers to the display service. The client can be a single program or a parallel program. To allow for different configurations of the clients and displays, we use TCP sockets to communicate between the clients and displays through a socket group abstraction. Display service has a dispatcher mode and a direct mode. The dispatcher mode has a head node, manages tails to the display nodes. And in the direct mode, client send tails directly to a display node without the head node. On the dispatcher and the display processes, multiple threads are used for receiving and sending data, and for decompressing tails on the displays. Communication between threads is managed by time stepped mailboxes, which can be filtered to return only messages for the current frame. After the frame is complete, Process 0 sends the token back to the client to begin rendering the next frame. This synchronization prevents the render from running faster than the displays and buffer too many tails, causing them to run out of memory. Moreover, users can configure the number of frames that can be in flight at once, allowing the renders to begin the next frame immediately to buffer some number of frames to reduce the latency. Integrating the client library to the renderer is easy. Clients first secure the size of virtual frame buffer from the display service using DW2 query info function through the information server. After connections between clients and display service are established, all clients then call DW2 begin frame function, which returns when the display service is ready to receive the next frame. The DW2 send RGBA function is used when the tails are ready to send to the display service. To run experiments, we use three display walls, Powerball, Nightball, SGE, and Rattler Attack. Powerball is the largest of the three. Nightball is equipped with Intel Nux, which is lightweight mini PCs with low cost. Powerball Nightball has the same network configuration and can be accessed externally. Rattler attack has to access through the head node. Benchmarks are run using pre-rendered images by Osprey. We aim to isolate the performance impacts of the different configurations of our framework from the renderer's performance. We tested on the landing gear, Moana Allen scene, and the generated varying colors. The landing gear has a complex ISO surface and a large amount of background which is compressed well. Moana Allen Singh has high detail geometries and textures which are challenging to compress. The varying color image is a synthetic benchmark which is difficult to compress. We use on-site and remote render clients in our experiments. For on-site benchmarks, we use a local cluster with 8 Intel Xeon 5 KNL processors. Remote rendering benchmark use 8 KNL nodes on Stampede 2. When evaluating the display performance when using different tail sizes on the client, we found that small tail sizes underutilize the network and achieve poor performance. Larger tail sizes reducing communication overhead and achieving better performance as a result. This in fact is more pronounced in the dispatcher mode shown as the dotted line. We evaluated the performance impact of the JPEG quality setting. As display walls are typically hundreds of megapixels, compression is crucial to reducing the needs of manuals to achieve interactive rendering performance. We also evaluated the scalability of DW2 when increasing the number of displays or the number of clients. We found the direct mode scales well with both the number of displays and clients since each client and display pair can communicate independently, whereas the dispatcher mode introduces a bottleneck at the head node. We have shown some user cases in the paper. To render this unstructured volume, we integrated our library to a GPU recaster to render across six nodes, each with two GTX 1070s, 
and displayed locally on the parable using the direct mode. We also integrated into a CPU retracer Osprey, rendered remotely on 64 nodes as MP2, and streamed back to the power wall using the direct mode. In conclusion, we present a lightweight open source framework for driving tail display walls that can be integrated into CPU and GPU renderers easily. The frameworks can operate in the dispatcher or direct mode to support typical network configurations. We also demonstrate this framework for use in deploying low-cost alternatives for display walls. We would like to thank Joa for helping running experiments and Tyke for providing access to Rattler and stamp 2 Thanks for Intel Graphics and Visualization Institute for supporting the project. You can find the project source code and supplemental material on the GitHub. Thank you all for attending. I can take questions now. All right, thank you very much for the nice presentation. Uh, I'm gonna start collecting questions. Mm -hmm. um, and until I see one, I'm gonna, I'm gonna ask a question because I'm wondering, is there an upper threshold for how many displays you can use with your framework? Did you test on that? So we tested on three different walls. So the biggest one is like nine by three a nine by four monitors, one is, uh, each one is like uh, two, it's more than 2K. Yeah, that's the biggest, uh, the largest power ball we tested on. Okay, but you, you don't, you didn't shift the boards until you figured out there's some problem or something. No, I think it depends on the your rendering machine and the network configurations. If, if you have like a very high resolution display wall, you have to have more rendering nodes and you have to have like high speed connection, network connections. All right, thank you very much. Um, are there any more questions from the audience? Okay, well, then if not, we're gonna go for the next talk, who's going to be Uncertain Transport and Unsteady Flows. And the talk is going to be given by Tobias Rapp. Thank you. Welcome to our short paper about uncertain transport and unsteady flows. These satellite images show plumes of phytoplankton in the ocean which form visible, distinct patterns. These patterns are governed by the Lacroixian coherence structures, which organize the transport of a material in a flow. The goal of our paper is to identify such patterns in uncertain or stochastic flows and to characterize the uncertainty in a transport. But let's take a step back. An unsteady flow is an ordinary differential equation. Central to the transport is the flow map phi which maps a tracer particle at position x0 and time t0 to a position at time t1, so after integration. Now, we can define the finite time Lapron of exponent, the FTLE, a quantity that is used to identify Lacroixian coherence structures, the LCS, and is by itself a powerful visualization. It is defined as the amount of separation between close starting points after we integrated them over the time interval. If we look at the actual equation, the FLE is thus based on the derivative of the flow map, which defines the so-called strain tensor. Let's look at some results on an elliptic flow containing two counter-rotating gyres. Here, the FLE shows regions with high separation, thus indicating barriers to the transport of a material. Our work is about uncertainty in flows. We model this uncertainty in a flow using a stochastic differential equation which adds a stochastic component to a deterministic vector field. 
We assume that the stochastic component is Gaussian. The stochastic flow is thus given by a mean and covariance at each point in space and time. Now we can numerically integrate the stochastic differential equation, but it requires Monte Carlo estimation and is computationally expensive. Prior work uses stochastic numerical integration to extend the concept of this Lacroixian coherence structures, the LCS, to uncertain flows. In particular, Gu and colleagues presented the FTLE D. This is similar to the FTLE, but is computed from the expected strain tensor. In the example shown on the right, we have stochastically advected the starting points. Then we average the strain tensor from these different endpoints and compute a single FTLE value. The authors further introduce the DFTLE, which estimates the distribution of FTLEs. In this talk, we focus on the FTLE D, but more experiments for both definitions are in the paper. Here, we create an uncertain flow by estimating the uncertainty during the discretization of the analytic flow to a space-time grid. Compared to the FTLE of the mean flow, the FTLE D smooths out some of the features and also contains some noise, but is still qualitatively similar to the FTLE. Now, we use recent work in the dynamical systems community that identifies barriers and enhancers to stochastic or to diffusive transport. This theory is similar to the Lacroix coherence structures, but assumes stochastic deviations. It is based on a scale-independent diffusion component. In the paper, we show how to derive this diffusion from the covariance matrix. Then, we extend the definition of the strain tensor. This might look overwhelming at first, but there are only two new concepts that are highlighted here. The first is a diffusion that is applied to the derivative of the flow map. The second one is the integral. The integral is required because we are now averaging over the whole time interval. So we're not just looking at the endpoints of each tracer particle, but everything in between. Let's look at an example. We start integrating our initial particles. We are only using the deterministic part of the flow, so no stochastic integration is required. Now at each step during integration, we evaluate the derivative of the flow map and weight it with the diffusion term. From this new strain tensor, we define the diffusion barrier strength, the DBS. This is a quantity that is similar to the FTLE, but indicates barriers and enhancers to transport that inherently includes this diffusion component. Looking at some results reveals that the DBS shows considerable less but sharp transport barriers for this data set. One limitation of the DBS is that it does not incorporate the absolute scale of uncertainties, only this concept of scale invariant diffusion. To address this limitation, we propose a visualization of the transport uncertainty in the Lacroixian frame. In detail, we attract a tracer particle and at each step, we measure the encountered uncertainty, which is the spread of the covariance matrix. Then we average this uncertainty over time. On the lower right, you can see the transport uncertainty for this data set. For example, it shows a high uncertainty in the center of both guys. In this real world data set from the Cyvus contest this year, we estimate the mean and covariance field from the ensemble members. The left image shows the backward DBS, which indicates transport enhancers that is highly diffusive or mixing regions. The middle image shows the transport uncertainty, which is apparently really high in the lower right part, the Gulf of Aden. The FDLED on the right side is quite different from the DBS. In particular, the Gulf of Aden on the lower right shows very different structures. Here's the actual, similar to distribution of temperature at the start and at the end of the time interval. We can make out several features indicated by the DBS, especially in the Gulf of A in the lower right part of the dataset, which indicates a strong amount of mixing of different temperatures. So to summarize, we introduce, we apply, and we evaluate the theory of stochastic transport barriers and enhancers. The theory is closely related to the Lagrangian coherence structures but inherently assumes some stochastic deviations in the flow. A major advantage of the DBS is that it does not require stochastic integration.
but it ignores the absolute scale of stochastic deviations. To address this, we developed a visualization of transport uncertainty in the Lagrangian frame. So thank you for your attention and you can find more details, evaluations and code in the paper and in our supplemental material. Thank you. All right, thank you Tobias for the very nice presentation. Um, here's a question by Michael Sorino, uh, and he's asking, did you use hardware accelerated compression? Uh, no, we are not doing that, no. Um, we did have some issues with the big data set, the cyber contest data set, but we just managed to uh, throw enough hardware at the problem. Mm -hmm. uh, and Angji Guo is asking, can you comment if this method could work for non-Gaussian distributed uncertain vector fields? Uh, no, it does not. Um, it's a very clear limitation of our work, but um, I've thought long about this and I do believe that non-Gaussian flows are problematic in general. Um, and there's also, if you look at the integration over time, you see a lot of averaging. So I think uh, due to the central limit theory, there's actually a lot of reasons for using Gaussian flows. But um, I think in the future, we want to definitely consider this a bit more. Okay. Well, then I also have a question. As if, I, if I got you right, you uh, visualized different things with your met methodology and you showed them side by side. Um, are there any attempts to merge those visualizations? There are no attempts. Um, could be interesting. I haven't thought about it. Um, it's a bit different, difficult considering which channels you could use to convey this information at the same time. So I'm not sure how you would do that, but it's certainly interesting. Okay. I think there um, are coming some more questions in. I'm going to wait a second. Oh, no. oh, okay. Well, then, thank you very much for your uh, nice presentation. And we're going to come to the next paper, which is high quality real-time ray casting and ray tracing of stream tubes with sparse voxel arc trees. And the presentation is gonna be given by Tim McGraw. So the stage is yours. Hi, I'm Tim McGraw and thanks for attending my talk. High quality real-time ray casting and ray tracing of stream tubes with sparse voxel arc trees. In this introduction, I'll describe our project goal, tell you how we will use sine distance functions and sparse voxel arc trees, and describe the contributions of our work. Our goal is to visualize in real time many fiber tracks from diffusion tensor MRI, both up close and at a distance, without any of the visual artifacts that approaches such as tessellated tubes or imposters have. Sine distance functions are implicit functions which can be efficiently raycast since the function returns a distance which can be used to skip empty space. Smooth SDF primitives appear smooth at any distance and also permit efficient computation of soft shadowing and ambient occlusion. Complex shapes can be achieved by combining primitives using Boolean operations. However, to compute the union of hundreds of thousands of tubes would require the evaluation of hundreds of thousands of SDFs. Sparse voxel arc trees are a hierarchical representation for a scene, which is memory efficient, since empty nodes are not explicitly stored. The structure can be ray traced by computing ray plane intersection tests as we traverse the tree, but the SVO would need to be very deep to achieve a smooth appearance of curved surfaces. The three contributions of our work are a GPU-based voxelization technique, which allows us to convert geometric streamlines into a voxelized SDF representation, an SVO representation for real-time ray tracing of stream tubes made up of straight tube segments, and a hybrid ray tracing ray casting method for stream tubes composed of curved tube segments. Before describing our approach, I'll briefly describe some related work in these areas. Sparse hierarchies such as octrees are commonly used in graphics and visualization for representing volumes and surfaces, such as isosurfaces of scalar fields. In large datasets, the memory overhead of only the node pointers in the tree becomes prohibitive. 
Gigavoxels have a low memory requirement due to several optimizations in tree representation and efficient rendering due to leveraging hardware texture filtering. Lane and Keras avoid blocky voxelized appearance by approximating the embedded surface with a slab which intersects each voxel. In our work, we use tube segments in each voxel to represent the surface. Many voxelization techniques have been developed to convert other surface representations, such as triangle meshes, into voxels. Our voxelization approach is similar to the slicing approach of Fang and Chen, which involves scanning through the scene with a sequence of viewing volumes. It's also possible to take a projection approach instead of slicing. It's even possible to voxelize directly into a sparse octree. Sign distance functions are an alternative to triangle meshes for scene representation. Hart made early explorations of this representation and developed the iterative sphere tracing technique for rendering, sometimes called ray casting or ray marching nowadays. He also described CSG techniques for combining simple primitives into more complex shapes, and suggested the idea of octree space partitioning for accelerating the rendering process, which is the approach we take. Evans described an approach to estimating ambient occlusion from a voxelized scene distance function. The intuition is, if you cast a ray away from a point, the surface is unoccluded, you expect the distances to monotonically increase. If they don't, then the point is occluded and an occlusion factor can be estimated. In our results, we use this method on our voxelized stream tube distance function for ambient occlusion and soft shadowing. Many approaches to rendering stream tubes have been proposed in the literature. A common approach is to simply tessellate them with triangles. Impostors are quadrilaterals, which are oriented to face the viewer, but shaded as if the geometry was cylindrical. The illusion can break when looking into the end of a tube. The geometry shader can generate tube segments from line segments, but often at a severe performance penalty. The tessellation shader is better suited to geometry amplification, as shown by Nunez et al. However, their approach does not address curved tube segments or lighting effects. Previous methods describing ray tracing of stream tubes, such as Han et al., use ray tracing for shading. By contrast, our approach uses the SDF representation for lighting. In this section, I'll give an overview of our methods and describe details of tube voxelization, SVO construction, and describe two rendering techniques, one for straight tube segments and one for curved tube segments. For rendering, we process a collection of streamlines by voxelizing them as stream tubes and inserting the voxels into an SVO. The octree leaf nodes are decorated by storing references to the line segments that intersect the corresponding voxel. In essence, the voxels of the SVO form the proxy geometry within which we can ray trace or ray cast tubes. We voxelize stream tubes by rendering imposters for each line segment, proceeding slice by slice through the dataset. We color each fragment of the imposter with the sign distance to the tube. By rendering with the minimum blending mode, we effectively compute the union of the tube segments. These imposters represent slices of a tube bounding volume, not projections of a tube surface. So there's no problem when the slice plane is perpendicular to the line segment. We can also voxelize curved tubes from the imposters by computing a transformed distance function. In this paper, the bending transformation is represented by a rotation matrix M, which is quadratically interpolated along the length of the imposter. At each endpoint, the rotation aligns the line segment with the stream tube tangent. At the middle of the imposter, there's no rotation, so M is an identity matrix. We convert the dense voxelization to an SVO by building the tree from the voxels near the tube surface. To improve memory coherence, we sort the voxels in Z-curve or Morton code order and build the tree in a bottom-up fashion. We decorate leaf nodes with references to the tubes which intersect the voxel. To give the tree structure a regular layout in memory, we fix the maximum number of tube segments a leaf node can reference. We used a maximum of four tube segments per voxel. In the paper, we give pseudocode for a modified KD restart algorithm for ray tracing the SVO, which we implement in fragment shader code. When we find a leaf node intersected by the ray, we test voxel contents for intersection using an analytic expression for the ray tube intersection point. The intersection point is then shaded using the voxelized SDF. Traversing the SVO is identical for curved tubes. However, when we encounter a leaf node, we ray cast the curved tube distance function since there's no expression for the ray intersection. Now let's see some results of voxelization and rendering of straight and curved tubes.
This table shows the memory requirements of the voxelized representation of the stream tubes for six of our data sets, ranging from the smallest to the largest. When interpreting the SVO size, compare to the two gigabytes required for a dense array of floats at the same resolution. This representation achieves good compression, even though our data is not sparse in the interior of dense fiber bundles, as shown in the image on the right. This table shows rendering performance for six of our data sets. Smaller datasets have more large empty octree nodes, which the ray tracer can efficiently skip. Curved tube ray casting is slower, but still interactive. Note that these times are for moderate consumer level hardware. These images show two of our larger datasets rendered with ambient occlusion computed from the voxelized stream tube distance function. And here's a detail showing the visual difference between straight and curved tube segments. To generate these images, we merged all 25 of our data sets, a total of 19.5 million streamlined vertices, and then voxelized the merged data. These images demonstrate that we can resolve intersections between tubes within a voxel. We can also use per vertex, per segment, or per tube attributes when rendering, which allows us to color tubes by fiber direction, and also allows fiber painting by user brushing. In conclusion, voxelizing the stream tubes and storing them as a decorated SVO gives us a memory-efficient representation for rendering. We achieve real-time rendering performance for straight tube segments and interactive performance for large data sets of curved tubes. The four-tube voxel constraint is sometimes violated in the interior of a data set, which would make rendering semi-transparent tubes problematic. In future work, we plan to investigate ways of overcoming this limitation, such as pre-processing to determine the optimal voxel size for a given number of tubes per voxel, and adaptively subdividing in dense regions of fibers. Can I go? Hello. <laughs> All right. Um, so thank you very much for your nice talk. And Benjamin Vrusik is asking, uh, is, uh, where does the four tube segments per leaf voxel come from? Uh, is there a maximum or how did you, did you choose that? Uh, we, we picked that just so we could have a regular layout in memory. So associated with each uh, leaf node, we have four slots in which we can store an index of the of the tube segment. Uh, so we could easily have picked a larger number, um, but we had to pick some value and that that ends up being the, the maximum for any given node. Okay. Um, Michael Sereno is asking, uh, is the gain on the quality of curved stream use worth the loss of interactivity? Uh, and he says 80, uh, 80 um, <clears throat> min, uh, milliseconds is almost 40 uh, frames per second, so. Uh, personally, no, I, I, for the most part, when people we see use these visualizations, they aren't really zoomed in far enough to, to see those types of, of details, whether the streamlines are, are curved or not, but I think maybe for, for generating maybe animations to be looked at offline, that, that could be more useful, because yes, that, that does get pretty slow. Mm -hmm. uh, Jonas Lukacek is asking, can you elaborate a bit more on how you use Morton encoding? Um, so what that has to do with is the layout of these leaf nodes of the sparse voxel oak tree in memory. And so we can really linearize where these are uh, by putting them in, into Morton order. Uh, so makes it easier when we, when we build the tree to, to have them sorted into that order so we can sort of figure out exactly where they are within the hierarchy rather than having to kind of descend the tree and, and place each one. Mm -hmm. uh, Thomas Schultz wants to know if there's an implementation available for general use. Um, not yet, but I do want to, want to put one out there because uh, I know there's a lot of these TCK and TRK files out there at the, uh, human connectome project and things like that. So uh, yeah, I'm looking at, at doing that pretty soon. Okay. 
And the final question, uh, Luis Gerardo de la Fraga wants to know, could you possibly uh, use beast plant tubes? Um, well, I'm going to look at the one of the next talks here and, and look at maybe using her meat splines. Uh, is, that's kind of similar to uh, what was, I guess, a little bit of a, of a hack, the way we, we implemented the curved stream tubes uh, by doing the quadratic interpolation. Um, we really would have liked to have something more like an actual or meat spline. So yeah, I'll be looking at, at one of these later talks to see about implementing that rather than be uh, spines. All right, thank you very much for a nice talk, cuddle your cat, and uh, see you, uh, and let's go for the next talk, which is uh, GPU-based weight casting of Hermit's spline tubes, which is going to be given by Benjamin Rusich. Hello, my name is Benjamin Russig from TU Dresden and I will be presenting a technique for GPU-based ray casting of Hermite spline tubes on behalf of my colleagues today. I will also be happy to answer any questions you might have after the talk. Alright, I'll start with a brief recap on what tubes are and why they are so important in scientific visualization. And I will be turning off my camera feed now to save some screen real estate, but I will be seeing you again shortly. So, tubes are a tried and proven tool in visualizing both abstract and actual curve data. Examples include stream and path lines emerging from vector fields or actual structures like nerve tracts in the human brain. Tubes refer to any structure that results from executing a volume from a curve by sweeping a cross-section shape along that curve. And in the visualization community, this cross-section is usually circular or some other simple convex shape. They provide superior structural perception, especially when combined with global illumination to provide additional depth cues. They are, however, not straightforward to render efficiently. Over the years, a variety of methods have been proposed, offering tube primitives with various trade-offs between rendering speed and visual fidelity. Most relevant to our method are primitives that define a way to raycast the tube surface. Raycasting naturally reproduces surfaces in high quality and is generally fast when implemented on modern GPUs. However, with the exception of the original generalized cylinders and the spline tubes offered by the Empre ray tracing kernels, these methods still require dense sampling to accurately depict high curvature in the data, especially when the curve is observed from a close distance. This is because they are linear in between samples to obtain lower order surface descriptions that can be raycasted efficiently. Tessellation based techniques are similarly affected and world space tessellation in particular might end up with a large amount of geometry. With Hermite spline tubes, we propose a technique that offers high fidelity tubes by means of a higher order surface description, greatly reducing the required sampling rate. And as we will show later, they can be efficiently raycasted on modern GPUs. Our tube model represents curved features that includes the curve of the tube axis itself, but also smooth transitions of visual attributes like color or radius via third degree polynomials defined in the Hermite basis. Our ray intersection routine works in principle with other bases as well, as long as they are polynomial. But we believe the Hermite basis to be the most interesting for visualization for the following reasons. A Hermite curve is defined by two nodes specifying a value and derivative each, which the curve will interpolate. By sharing nodes between two segments, we get to see one continuous Hermite spline. And it does not take a lot of digging into possible use cases to see that this curve definition maps incredibly well to real life data. Our model defines position, radius, and color as visual attributes that vary according to the Hermite splines defined by the data. The tube surface is defined by sphere tracing the attribute splines, which, as I will show you in a bit, is important for our ray intersection routine. For the appearance of the tubes, this means hemispherical end caps and, as a nice side effect, natural avoidance of the bulb artifacts that this space models are susceptible to without special handling. So, in summary, our contribution is the Hermite spline tube, a new primitive for visualizing curved data that can be raycasted efficiently thanks to a fast ray intersection routine. We also present a rasterization-based algorithm for the tube model, which I will only give a brief overview of in this talk. I want to point out that we support features that are highly desirable for any tube-based visualization system, including varying radii according to the tube model, sharp corners through tangent discontinuities, and bifurcations through shared nodes. Let's now take a look at our method in more technical detail. Since we believe it to be our core contribution, I will focus on the ray tube intersection routine. The basic idea is to formulate the intersection problem in terms of a function that maps the curve parameter t to the parameter of the ray equation, which we dub L. Since every segment between two nodes of a Hermite spline is independent, we can look at single Hermite curves in isolation. 
we define our function such that for a given t we get the ray parameter of the front facing intersection of the ray with the sphere at t. This is made easier by transforming the curve to ray space, such that one of the basis vector coincides with the ray itself. We can then base our function on the algebraic intersection of a sphere at point P with radius R with, for example, the x-axis. Parametrizing this in terms of the Hermite curves that define our sphere, we obtain a model of the intersection problem that we can use. To make the problem easier to handle, we also introduce two auxiliary functions, h and g, abstracting away the individual polynomials. To find the first intersection with the ray, this function must be minimized, which we accomplish by finding the roots of its first derivative. Obviously, f is real only with an intervals where g is positive, so the roots of g need to be found first. Efficient real root isolation is a non-trivial problem, but since we are dealing with polynomials of generally low degree and functions composed of them, we can use a fairly simple and straightforward algorithm. Real root isolation yields brackets around the roots from which one can start performing a robust numerical method like bisection or the second approach. For polynomials, we can utilize the fact that all real roots inside some interval are bracketed between two extrema or an extremum and an interval border. This means that we can derive g until it is guaranteed that only one root lies inside the interval and then recursively use the roots and the outer interval borders as brackets for finding the roots of the next higher degree version of g, ignoring brackets that don't evaluate to opposite signs at the interval borders. For a polynomial of degree n, this algorithm has a complexity of n squared plus n divided by 2. However, the algorithm can be started from a derivative for which a closed form solution exists. This simple algorithm can calculate the real roots of a low degree polynomial very efficiently, and as previously stated, we use it on g to find the real intervals of the function f that models our ray intersection. f itself though is not a polynomial. We did however find from extensive empirical study that the number of roots in each derivative of f does indeed decrease in the same manner, although we cannot offer a theoretical proof for this at the moment. Either way, we employ this algorithm to isolate the roots of f dash also. Lastly, to decrease the total number of root searches required for the intersection, we can subdivide each cubic Hermite curve into two quadratic Bezier curves, bringing down the degree of g to 4. This means that we have to perform a maximum of 7 root searches initially to find the intervals where f dash is real. Then we have to perform the algorithm on f dash and its next two derivatives for a maximum of 5 root searches per interval. This is exploiting the fact that whenever f has 3 extrema inside a real interval, as is depicted to the right here, the middle one is always a maximum and can thus be ignored. In total, that means 17 root searches for a single ray cast in the worst case. Bear in mind though that for most configurations in practice, the ray intersects the cube only once, meaning just one real interval in F to process, significantly bringing down the average number of root searches per ray cast. In the paper, we also present a rasterizer-based rendering algorithm that we implemented in OpenGL, which I will just very briefly summarize here. Basically, we organize node and segment data into a vertex and index buffer respectively for use with the rasterization pipeline. We utilize the geometry shader to generate oriented bounding boxes around the curved segments and perform our raycasting routine in the fragment shader. Finally, I want to showcase the results of a preliminary performance analysis that, we think, nicely illustrates that raycast into my spline tubes are a viable choice for interactive visualization of curved data. We used five datasets of varying size and complexity for the measurements, the specifics of which you can see here. We compare the performance against a dynamic workspace tessellation scheme that uses the hardware tessellation stages as well. To mimic typical usage and practice, we rotated the camera in an orbit around the datasets for 1000 frames in two different zoom levels. Our tests showed that our intersection routine performs fast enough to be used in an interactive setting, as we could consistently achieve over 37 frames per second even for the most demanding test cases. We could also confirm that our rendering algorithm scales better with dataset size than can be expected of tessellation-based approaches. However, since our rasterization-based renderer still needs to generate triangles for the bounding boxes, it is consequently still impacted by increased geometry load for larger datasets, albeit at a much reduced rate. We isolated this effect by measuring render times with no upfragment processing. The corresponding timings are coded here in the hatchet areas. We therefore want to look at alternative means of silhouette generation, including mesh shaders and pre-computation, although this will require trading off with increased memory consumption. Image auto rendering is also a promising option. We are eyeing NVIDIA's RTX feature set in particular here. With this, I thank you very much for your attention and I'm now happy to answer your comments and questions.
All right. Thank you uh, for the very nice talk. Uh, I'm going to collect questions if I find some. Um, hold on. Um, I think there is one coming up. Uh, maybe until then, I'm going to uh, ask a question. Um, I am wondering, does the Hermit uh, splines somehow change the appearance in comparison to, like, let's say, well-known methods for uh, rendering those tubes? Um, so um, I'm not quite sure what you mean by other uh, well-known methods, but um, basically once uh, if this method can do like an, an actual recasting of the surface meaning there's no tessellation you will always have a smooth appearance of course so there are other methods that also result in a smooth appearance um, i guess the the novel thing in this case is just the way the ray intersection works which is potentially very efficient um, okay. but appearance wise i would not think that there is much of a of an improvement or the other smooth methods basically okay uh, Thomas Schulz is asking, uh, I wonder how much effort it would be to generalize these two tubes with a super quadric cross section. And he also wants to know, do you happen to have thought about this? Um, so yes, uh, we did think about this um, a lot actually. Um, so there, I don't have an answer for you yet, but um, so one thing that we are looking at uh, or will be looking at in the near future is um, having ellipsoids at least. So this would not be a, a super quadric yet, but, um, or at least not the, the full set of them. But yeah, we are looking into extensions. Um, I cannot tell you how difficult it will be, but I guess um, the, the overall algorithm that does the root finding will still work. It's just a matter of, of what function we will actually get when, um, yeah, when we describe the problem with a non-spherical primitive. All right. Thank you very much for answering the questions. And our next um, if, if If I may, I think you might have missed one. Uh, Sorry? There, there were some earlier, yeah, which uh, were asking if I'm aware of a, of a paper. Um, the, the phantom hair intersector. Oh, yeah. Oh, I, hair the sector, yeah. uh, I wanted to answer that as well because I'm actually not aware of this and my Google foo failed <laughs> failed me to, to find it in time for this Q&A sessions, but um, I, I will try uh, to read through it quickly and maybe come back to you later on this. All right, perfect. Thank you very much. So uh, our next talk is going to be uh, implicit ray casting of the parallel vectors operator and the talk is going to be given by Roman Vici. So the stage is yours. Hi there, my name is Ram Vici and I'm presenting our paper on implicit ray casting of the parallel vectors operator co-authored with Tobias Günther. We are from the Department of Computer Science at ETH Zurich in Switzerland. The parallel vectors operator introduced by Packet and Roth is a very versatile formalism that given two vector fields V and W gives us back the set of solutions where those two vector fields are parallel. In 3D space, this boils down to where the cross product of the two vector fields is equal to zero. Note that the set of solutions are lines, and one application of this might be the extraction of vortex core lines important in fluid dynamics. The schematic we see on this slide describes the possible solutions of V parallel W and vice versa. We can either have that the vectors are parallel or anti parallel, or at least one of the two is zero. So in a typical parallel vectors operator extraction pipeline, what we first do is to extract the line geometry explicitly in a pre-processing step. Afterwards, we filter for the desired curve. So for example, for the vortex core lines, which might only be a subset of all possible parallel vector solutions in a given dataset. Finally, we visualize the results. The advantage of such a method is that we explicitly extract the line geometry of the dataset in one go. The disadvantage is that if we want to explore the data set and just change some parameters to see what happens, or if we actually need to change the parameters, for example, to find a reference frame in an unsteady flow, then we need to recompute everything from scratch. This might only take a couple of seconds each time we change something, but this accumulates with increasing number of parameters. Alternatively, we can also implicitly raycast the parallel vectors operator. 
For this, we ray march through the 3D volume data, here illustrated in 2D. This works by tracing a ray from the camera for each pixel. Using a step size, we can sample initial guesses along the rays. Given an initial guess, we can then descend onto the parallel vector solution and span the line geometry around it. With this, we can visualize what the camera sees. This view dependency is an advantage of implicit ray casting. Since we only have to calculate what we see through the camera, we can specifically optimize for it. Some important previous work comes from Kindleman et al. Kindleman derived a general method to implicitly render extremal structures of scalar fields. And as a subset of this, they describe parallel vector solutions as extremal lines. And the formulation is the dot product between the two normalized vector fields. So this can be seen as an optimization problem, which we can solve via a second order Newton descent. However, we derive an approach that only requires a first order method by specializing on the parallel vectors problem, and we can also explicitly extract the geometry similar to Kindleman and colleagues. Our goal is to achieve real-time ray casting and we consider a general GPU-based volume ray casting framework that given the two vector fields V and W, we want to output the direct visualization of where those two vector fields are parallel. Since we only consider 3D space, this can be seen as a root finding problem. Visualized here the two input vector fields V, the velocity on the left, and W, for example, the acceleration on the right. During the ray traversals, many voxels contain empty space. So we first compute the filter mask that allows us to skip these unnecessary computations. The filter mask needs to be pre-computed. However, that takes less than a second and only needs to be done once. During ray traversal, when we then sample initial guesses that are not already filtered by our pre-computed filter mask, we need to be able to quickly descend onto the parallel vector's feature curves to then span the geometry and visualize the result. Schindler et al. introduced the predictor corrector method that we could successfully adapt during our ray traversal, resulting in an efficient first order scheme. In the visualization we see here, on the left the ground truth in yellow and on the right our approach in blue and we see that our method can closely approximate the ground truth. Next, we consider an example application where we use NVIDIA index and CUDA kernels to implement our method. We would like to emphasize that both the parallel vector solutions visualized as line structures and the vorticity magnitude visualized as volume rendering are computed in real time in all scenes of this video. In our first example, we visualize a 3D unsteady swirling jet flow undergoing a vortex breakdown. Here we can see the parallel vector solutions of our method for the velocity field and the acceleration field. And here for the velocity field and the jerk field. Note that this is numerically more challenging to do because the jerk field is second order. As in all scenes of this video, the volume rendering depicts the vorticity magnitude. Now let's consider a magnetic field, the Borromean rings. Once again, here we can see all parallel vector solutions of the velocity field and the acceleration field. And here we see all possible solutions of the velocity field and the jerk field. Note that for the scenes seen so far, the rendering resolution was 500 by 500. For the interactive example that comes next, the rendering resolution is 1000 by 1000. Here again, we see all parallel vector solutions of the velocity field and the acceleration field. We change the alpha value and the radius here linearly scaled directly in real time. We have seen that this dataset is actually a time series, so let's just play it back. And we see that this still works completely in real time. We can also compute the volume rendering of the vorticity magnitude on the fly. Finally, we can also rotate the volume interactively in the viewport. Lastly, we want to show that with the section Newton descent, we can also explicitly extract the geometry. 
For this, we sample uniformly at random particles in the whole volume domain and descend onto the parallel vector feature curves with the sectional Newton descent. We then construct this geometry using vertices. And the more particles we sample, the better gets our approximation of the line geometry. In this talk, we presented a new efficient approach to implicitly raycast the parallel vectors operator. This enables the convenient exploration and adjustment of parameters and can improve the workflow. From our own experience, we think it is straightforward to implement our method into already existing extraction pipelines, where it can be used as an efficient preview before, if needed, an explicit extraction is made. Hi. Thank you very much for the nice talk. Uh, I'm gonna collect questions and until they're coming in, I actually have one question. So you said uh, you believe that your uh, technique can be directly implemented into existing pipelines. Is there an attempt to provide such an implementation in, let's say, in, on on a on an open source platform, or that you integrate it into VTK or some other uh, frameworks that are also out there? Um, we implemented the method in um, basically in a CUDA kernel so far, mm -hmm. and in DirectX. Uh, the algorithm itself is really not um, it, it's not big. It's it's um, quite short actually. Um, so we didn't really plan to um, to release some uh, open source contribution, but I think it's um, it's something to consider, definitely. Okay. So are there any further questions on the methodology? Hello. Okay. Then I have another one. Uh, did you try to push the boundaries until you, let's say, have a data set that is too big to be rendered in uh, real time? So what, what are the limits? Well, the limits are that um, we, well, it basically depends. The, the more complex the data set is, the, um, the harder it gets to achieve real time performance. So, what we, uh, what we think is important that we have an efficient method that can scale quite well. And I think we uh, achieved that. So, basically, what, what we hope is that with uh, better hardware, um, we can get bigger and bigger uh, data sets, right? So, but I think there's obviously also a lot of room for improvement. Um, we think that, uh, for especially in the empty space skipping. All right, thank you very much. So let's let us come to the next talk. It's going to be a GPU parallel computation of more smell complexes, and the talk is going to be given by Varshini Subhash. Stage is yours. Hello everyone and thank you for joining my talk today. My name is Varshni Subhash and I will be presenting our paper titled as GPU Parallel Computation of Most Meal Complexes. A Most Meal Complex is essentially a topological descriptor that succinctly captures the gradient flow of a scalar function. This framework allows for multi-scale topological analysis and visualization of large scientific data. Most mill complexes are widely used in a number of application domains such as cosmology, biology, and material science, to name a few. In order to combat the exponential growth in data and increasing feature complexity, it becomes essential to devise efficient parallel algorithms for the computation of this descriptor. To give you a quick flavor of what a 2D most mill complex is, let us consider a sample scalar function which consists of a number of peaks and valleys. The critical points, namely the maxima, minima, and saddles, correspond to the points where the gradient of the function becomes zero. The most mean complex is the partition of this underlying function domain into regions of uniform gradient flow behavior as described by the integral lines shown. 
Existing techniques for the computation of 3D Morse mail complexes adopt serial or hybrid approaches which incur large runtimes for bigger data sets. This work focuses on addressing this gap with contributions as follows. We introduced the first completely GPU parallel pipeline for the computation of Morse mail complexes with our method achieving speedups of up to 7x over existing parallel approaches. We do this by targeting the major bottleneck of saddle path computation. First, we introduce a novel technique to mark saddle reachability by utilizing vector operations. Next, we present an algorithm to count paths between saddles by leveraging matrix multiplication based graph traversal. The computational pipeline for this task consists of four steps. The first step assigns gradient pairs which we borrow from the state of the art by Shiv Shankar et al. Further, these gradient pairs are used to locate all critical points. The third step, which is the primary bottleneck in existing approaches, involves the computation of saddle-saddle connections. The fourth and final step computes extrema connections in parallel, which we again borrow from Shiv Shankar et al. In this work, we incorporate incremental improvements to step 2 and focus the bulk of our attention on step 3, which poses the biggest challenge in terms of performance. Do note that we extensively leverage data parallel primitives such as prefix sum and stream compaction offered by the library Thrust, details regarding which are available in the paper. To zero in on the challenges encountered in step 3, Consider the directed acyclic graph that represents the collection of paths between all one saddles and two saddles. An example of this tag is shown in the 3D grid setting on the right, with the dark green cell represented by a two saddle and the light green cell corresponding to a one saddle. The paths between these one two saddle pairs undergo multiple splits and merges as shown, which leads to an exponential growth in the number of paths. The best known algorithms use serial variants of a breadth first search with the fastest method making use of a priority queue. A trivial parallelization is possible, but this fails to scale well. Our work aims to improve upon these methods by introducing a parallel algorithm which reduces step 3 to an embarrassingly parallel task. The first task is to mark reachable paths between one two saddle pairs by conducting a BFS traversal. Our parallel BFS algorithm iteratively computes and stores a frontier of nodes that are reachable from all source nodes, which in this case are the set of one saddles. During a given iteration, the current frontier discovers the next frontier and each discovered pair is represented by P in the graph shown with invalid pairs denoted by hashes. In this example, the second iteration will consist of the stream compacted set of valid pairs discovered in the first iteration and these nodes will go on to discover the next frontier. The algorithm terminates when all paths reach two saddles and the frontier becomes empty. The next task at hand is to reduce the saddle path counting problem to one that is amenable to parallelism. We do this by constructing a minor of the DAG by contracting all simple subpaths, a transformation that gives us nodes that are either one saddles, two saddles, or junction nodes. Here, a junction node denotes a node whose out degree is greater than one. The construction of the DAG minor is initiated in parallel by considering all one saddles and junction nodes as sources. Each path is traced in parallel and the destination node can either be a two saddle or a junction node. Since these are simple paths, each path is guaranteed to reach its destination without splits and the final step involves the storage of each unique source destination pair by the corresponding thread. The final step is to count all paths between saddles for which we leverage matrix multiplication based graph traversal. As shown, any graph can be represented 
as an adjacency matrix A, which when multiplied by the source vertices V gives us AV, which is the frontier discovered by the sources. We utilize CO sparse for all matrix multiplication operations, a choice that facilitates maximum scaling while avoiding a large memory footprint. Specifically, consider the DAG minor whose nodes may be placed in levels from 0 to n as shown. We first multiply edges connecting levels 0 and 1 with those connecting levels 1 and 2 to obtain edges connecting levels 0 and 2. Performing this iteratively in parallel and storing the newly discovered nodes in a storage matrix A star gives us the final set of nodes connecting one saddles at level 0 with junction nodes at the highest level. Further, we multiply A star with connections between junction nodes and two saddles to obtain all connections between one saddles and two saddles. We perform a final addition of matrix D which accounts for simple paths between one saddles and two saddles. We performed computational experiments on nine popular datasets and mentioned some salient results here. Our BFS algorithm achieves speedups of up to 129x as seen in the dataset foot. The path counting algorithm performs better for larger datasets with the highest speedup of 4.5x as seen in aneurysm. We observe speedups ranging from 1.33 to 7x for the overall more scale complex computation. With that, I'd like to conclude my talk. Thank you for your time and if there are any questions, I'd be happy to take them. All right, thank you very much for the talk. Uh, there are already two questions by Hamish Kaur. And uh, the first one is, do you have any insight on why foot has such a good speed up? So I believe um, foot has, uh, is a very large data set, which uh, implicitly um, gives us this notion of having a large number of critical points and a large number of junction points, which essentially um, exploits the, the uh, salient features of this work, which is to overcome the bottleneck of uh, excessive splits and merges. Okay, I think this already answers the uh, second question, which would be, might it be related to large amount of noise in it? So yeah, that's pretty much what you said. All right, I also have a question. Uh, I don't know if I missed it, but did you provide this as open source code? Right, so uh, we're releasing the source code for this as open source very shortly. And uh, we have some ongoing work, work as an extension to this. So once that's done, we'd be uh, good to go to release it. All right. Thank you very much. Uh, so mm -hmm. let's come to the next talk, uh, which is uh, a relationship where multivariate sampling strategy for scientific simulation data. And the talk's going to be given by Subhashish Hazarika. The stage is yours. Hello everyone, welcome to our talk about relationship aware multivariate sampling strategy for scientific simulation data. As simulations start producing more and more high resolution data, it is becoming increasingly difficult to store the full resolution data for every time step and to perform post hoc analysis. A popular and effective solution to address this problem is to reduce the storage footprint by sampling the data beforehand. For this, Different flavors of sampling algorithms exist in literature. However, most of them address scalar fields of a single variable. Whereas scientific simulations often produce multivariate data with relationships across the variables. How to respect this relationship while sampling so that we can reliably perform various multivariate post hoc analysis? A naive solution can be to independently sample the individual variable fields but the subsequent multivariate analysis can be unreliable 
since we did not consider the variable relationships into picture. Since the variables are often correlated, it may not be even necessary to store all the variables. Our proposed solution is to preserve and utilize these variable relationships during sampling. To capture the global multivariate relationship, we first decompose the spatial domain into smaller partitions and apply locally linear models like PCA. In our work, we combine PCA with existing sampling algorithms for univariate data. While PCA lets us model the local multivariate relationship and reduce the variable dimensions, sampling algorithms help reduce the spatial data resolution. PCA also offers multivariate reconstruction error thresholds, which are useful for reliable post-hoc analysis. We facilitate various multivariate analysis directly on the sample data without having the need to reconstruct the full scalar fields for the variables. Here is a high-level overview of our proposed strategy. After partitioning the spatial domain, for each partition data with, say, big n number of data points and d variables, we first apply PCA to capture the multivariate relationship in the form of its eigenvectors, eigenvalues, and the mean vector and then proceed to reduce the variable dimensions to Q that captures say 99% variance in the data. Next, we apply sampling algorithms on the field of the first principal component to reduce the number of data points from big N to small n. The final sample data can be used to perform different multivariate analysis in the post hoc phase. Modeling the multivariate relationship using local linear models often depends on how well we partition the spatial domain. In our work, we use three different partitioning schemes, specially adapted for multivariate data. Also, to reduce the spatial resolution, we use two different flavors of univariate sampling algorithms to sample the field of the first principal component, which captures the maximum variance in the data. Please refer to our paper for the details of these three partitioning schemes and two sampling algorithms. Using the sample data, we perform three different types of multivariate analysis tasks without the need to reconstruct the full scalar fields back. For full multivariate reconstruction, we recover the d variable values for each sample data point from the Q principal components using inverse PCA transformation for each partitions. We observed that the data-centric partitioning schemes like KD tree and SLIC have low reconstruction error than regular partitions. Also, for a given multivariate query in the original d-dimensional variable space, we can convert it to the PCA space and then compute the distance of the sample points to the user-provided query. Here is an example of this for the Hurricane Isabel dataset for a query around the wall of the Hurricane I. The samples are opacity mapped to the query distance value. We can also use the eigenvectors, eigenvalues, and the mean vector for each partition to reconstruct the correlation matrix for selected variables. Here, we show the reconstructed correlation values between nitrite and iron for the Ocean BGC dataset for the sample points and compare it with the ground truth. To conclude, we have proposed a relationship-aware strategy to sample multivariate data which facilitates different multivariate analysis directly on the reduced data form. We experimented and tested different aspects of our method. At a high level, we observed that the partitioning schemes as well as the sampling rates and algorithms play an important role in how well we model the data and use it for subsequent analysis. You can refer to our paper for more details about these experiments. In future, we plan to extend it to temporal multivariate data using incremental PCA models, as well as deploy it for the purpose of in-situ data reduction. Last, but not the least, I would like to thank the following funding sources and thank you everyone for listening to the talk.
Thank you very for the very nice talk. Um, before there are coming questions in, because I don't see some right now, I actually have one question. So you said you have this uh, sampling over the different varieties of the of the field. Um, what about basically just melting them together, let's say in a, a linear com in a linear combination or something? And why do you need to make it such, let's say, complicated with a PCA analysis? I see. Yeah, I think that's a relevant question. Like we started off this work thinking in that direction, like looking at the entire field. But the problem is that with multivariate data, like uh, the relationship is not really linear, right? We had to like partition the space. And like, I actually like removed one explanation because the video was getting longer. So it's basically like you have, say you pick up two variables, pressure and temperature. They can have different relationship at different spatial locations. So what we want to do is that we want to intelligently partition the spatial domain so that we can capture the smaller relationships in a smaller linear piecewise, like PCA models. So that's the main goal of partitioning the space. So we tried it doing in the entire global space. The PCA doesn't really capture, the first two components doesn't really capture the entire variance in the data. So, and it was not a good model in that sense. So, so that's why partitioning is kind of important to like break it down or decompose into smaller units. All right, thank you very much. Mm -hmm. um, I'm going to wait Hi. for five more seconds if there's another question coming in. And if not, we're going to come to our last talk, which is, by the way, one of the honorable mention talks. Uh, and it's called Pragma Interactively Constructing Functional Brain Parcellations. And the talk is going to be given by Rosa G. Baranak and Nyung Huang. And the stage is yours. I'm Rosa. And I'm Yong. We're computer science PhD students at Vanderbilt University. And today we will present to you our paper titled Pragma, Interactively Constructing Functional Brain Parcellations. One of the prominent goals of human brain mapping is identifying brain regions that have similar roles in cognition and behavior. These regions are typically referred to as parcellations and the maps as atlases. With Broadman pioneering brain mapping, Many researchers created various atlases in various modalities. Not long ago, atlases have become particularly popular for localization of activations using functional magnetic resonance imaging. These maps of functional brain organization, also referred as functional atlases, are usually derived at the population level. In other words, the atlas regions are designed to capture functional brain patterns that are shared in common across individuals. However, there is considerable variability in the functional subdivisions at the level of individual person. To study individual variation in cognition and behavior, we need ways to explore organizational differences that deviate from these average maps. With this goal in mind, we designed Pragma, an interactive tool that allows domain experts to do just this, modify a mainstream atlas to better map onto subject-specific scans. This process, leverages existing population-based atlases, allows the investigation of hierarchical relationships between brain regions, and supports domain-specific analysis methods. These analyses are based on an input fMRI scan. A little bit background in fMRI. fMRI is a non-invasive technique that measures blood oxygen in the brain as a proxy for neural activity. Each scan is volumetric snapshots of the brain taken at different time points. Each 3D volume is divided into tiny cubic regions called voxels. Each voxel represents a fixed spatial location and the signal is the change in neural activation over time for that unique location. Parcellation through Pragma is an iterative process. Pragma initializes this process with an atlas of expert's choice and visually encodes the parcellation scheme as a hierarchical node link diagram. The user can modify their parcellation through this interactive tree where the decisions are guided by a set of linked and coordinated views. These views support time course data analysis for understanding homogeneity of parcels, the variability of the time series data, a functional connectivity core diagram to investigate interparcel relations, and an orthographic slice-based view of their current parcellation to locate unique parcels. 
The iterative process begins with this node link diagram, which is a hierarchical representation of an atlas. Within the parcellation scheme, each node represents a parcel. The atlas, whether anatomically or functionally driven, provides a strong prior to organization of the brain. On this node link diagram, the root node represents the whole brain. The next layer splits the parcels into the left and right hemispheres. And this layer of nodes shows seven functional networks on each hemisphere as given by the starting atlas. From this point outwards, the nodes are color-coded by their network, and this coloring scheme is matched across all the other views on the interface. For each network, we apply a glomer of clustering to group temporally correlated voxels together as parcels. The leaf nodes of the diagram make up the current parcellation scheme. From here, the expert can steer clustering with three actions, expand, collapse, and merge. When the parcel has low similarity, the expand action splits it into more granular parcels. Conversely, collapse will redefine a parcel that does not need to be further split. And when two parcels have similar properties, they can be combined using the merge action. The expert modifies the parcellation scheme with these three actions using information from the following set of supporting views. First, we look at homogeneity, which is calculated as the average pairwise temporal correlation for each parcel. We encode homogeneity as the size of the inner circle for every node, allowing for comparisons amongst length nodes. A good measure of functional correlation is time series similarity within a region. Since the time series signals represent neural activity change, if a region is functionally homogeneous, the time series signals from this region should be similar. Pragma supports analysis of signal similarity using a mean time course line plot with a standard error confidence interval. Two parcels can also be compared at once, which is useful during a merge evaluation. While the homogeneity glyphs and the time course plot depict within parcel properties, this core diagram allows the user to assess the functional connectivity between parcels. Functional connectivity is defined as the temporal correlation of every pair of regions, and it is used to measure co-activity of discrete regions during various brain states. The core diagram encodes the presence and strength of connectivity between regions. This view is designed to visualize the current parcellation scheme mapped onto a brain template. Every parcel is outlined by the color representing its functional network and is coordinated with the rest of the views in the interface. And here is the full interface of Pragma. Collectively, the visualizations guide the user through the iterative process of constructing parcellations. We will quickly walk through an example case that shows how a user may use the linked views to inform a merge decision. First, we can anchor this node and then see if there are any other nodes that are similar to it. Clicking on a second node allows us to directly compare the two. The time courses of both nodes are overlaid onto the line plot, where we can see that the signals have similar time courses. Looking at their functional connectivity, we see that these two parcels have similar connectivity patterns. And as seen in the orthographic views, the parcels are located in the same spatial proximity. These observations suggest that the two parcels are similar enough to be merged. After merging, two parcels are combined into one, and the new parcel's properties are recalculated, resulting in different homogeneity, time course, functional connectivity, and anatomical representation. Be consulted with domain experts at different stages of development, using their feedback to iteratively improve the tool. After the design converged, we conducted a user study with four domain experts over Zoom. In order to evaluate the design choices, intuitiveness, and effectiveness of Pragma, we encouraged free-form exploration of the tool with no time restrictions. The feedback was primarily positive, with users giving Pragma high ratings as a tool for subject-specific analyses. The ability to compare two parcels on multiple views at the same time was particularly well-received. One expert noted that a search for valid cognitive relations through single scan analysis was likely to result in inconsistencies, mainly because fMRI data is very noisy. Given the feedback that we received, we plan on addressing issues related to common sources of noise in fMRI data by visually conveying uncertainty as part of our design. Furthermore, we plan on making our system more extensible, handling various atlases, clustering algorithms, and similarity measures in order to better address demands from domain experts. Thank you for listening. Thank you.
All right, thank you very much uh, for that nice talk and uh, congratulations again for the honorable mention. So I got a first question from Michael Sereno and he <clears throat> is asking, are you aware of the Noisman algorithm for this particular capture? Uh, I'm a not- Particular fMRI capture, sorry for that. Mm -hmm. You are not, and I would love to know more about it if they can link on the uh, cord, Discord, the talk, the work they're talking about. Okay. Uh, I actually also have a question. You mentioned that you start with a uh, predefined atlas. And I mean, there are tons of atlases out there. Um, did you check on how much influence the selection of the first atlas has on the output of your algorithm? Uh, we started with using an atlas to test our uh, method. And we did not extend this work to apply for other atlases just yet. But the, uh, the, the, the test was within Schaefer Atlas that we used and they had 100 to 1000 different uh, parcellation schemes. And it seemed like the somewhere in the middle, which actually the paper itself mentions uh, was more stable in terms of uh, finding more homogeneous regions in functional MRI. Mm -hmm. And one last question maybe, um, if you map this back to the brain, um, is there any way on coping with uncertainties? I mean, maybe it's not so easy to differentiate parts of the brain uh, in, in terms of segmentation. So did you think about issues like that? We, we are aware of uh, the common sources of noise in fMRI and uh, in a future uh, uh, project, we are planning on uh, visually conveying this uncertainty, but we did not do any work on that yet. Okay, all right. Thank you very much for the very nice talk. And let us all thank all the speakers again. Uh, I love to hear all your very interesting talks. And uh, with that, I would like to close the first session of the short paper track. Thank you very much, everyone. Tableau helps you see the stories in your data. It's designed to help you be smarter so you can make better decisions faster. Connect to the data you care about. Sort, highlight, drill down, or filter your data in seconds. Add calculations to extend your data. With Tableau, you can keep on asking questions in the data until you discover the root cause. Tableau, answer questions at the speed of thought. Smartwatches can track a wide variety of data. We are interested to learn which type of data people consume and how it is visualized. To find out, we conducted a survey with 237 participants. We found a predominant display of health fitness data, with data mostly displayed as icons with text. Based on our findings, we discuss opportunities for visualization research on smartwatches. PowerVis, a tool for visualizing hypergraphs where edges can connect any number of nodes. PowerVis is the first technique to display hyper edges with no overlap or crossing. Vertices are represented as rows, time periods flow from left to right, and groups can be shown on the left. We designed the layout for readability. PowerVis shines with mid-size hypergraphs and it allows detailed analysis. We tested PowerVis successfully using publication datasets and data from historical documents.
Entities and their changing relationships can be modeled more precisely as temporal hypergraphs, but hypergraph models are difficult to explore and refine. By leveraging domain-specific geometric deep learning models and a new multi-level hypergraph visualization, our technique allows for the direct integration of domain knowledge into the machine learning process. The multivariate hypergraph model structure can be analyzed in different abstraction levels. Simultaneously, experts can integrate their domain knowledge on the fly and then explore the refined machine learning model. Imagine you have tons of text data to analyze. And you want to get an overview of your data, but traditional topping modeling techniques such as LDA are not working for you. Then, why don't you try Architext? We introduce a scalable and flexible way to interactively build hierarchical topics. Visualizing class separations is using applications such as classification and clustering. However, many dimension reduction techniques are limited due to the issues of separability and interpretability. We propose a visual analytics framework to support the exploration of nonlinear complex separation structures with the power of 